And now it's time to preview an upcoming game with Ryan Metzler. Hey everybody, it's Ryan Metzler here again with another Kickstarter preview. Today we're going to be taking a look at Shadow Star Corsairs, which is a space game, as you might have guessed, in which each player controls a fleet of ships and its crew uh, traversing the galaxy in order to collect resources, be it politics, tech, uh, could be money, could be uh, various other things, in order to try and convert those into resources that can be used to gain reputation. And gaining that reputation will eventually lead to commendations, victory points, and to winning the game. Uh, the players are going to be doing this on a variable player board that's going to change based on the number of players. Uh, the locations and safe and unsafe areas to travel will change and be relocated. Uh, but they're going to have a similar starting stock of things that they can use. A ship, some shuttles, some crew, and of course a starting location on the board. So real quick, why don't we take a look at what you're going to get inside of the box of the game. With a reminder, these are prototype components. We'll see how the game plays and we'll come back here at the end and I'll sum it all up for you. So here you can see the components for Shadow Star Corsairs all set up for a two-player game. The two-player game uses six of these boards, or four if you would like a smaller area, in order to generate a random area of space. And each of these has two different sides, so you can lay it out in order to have different types of layouts. Now, this board has different types of areas on it. We can see locations, which are going to be resource generation areas. These are outlined in blue. And they have a blue outline around the area, showing that all of those spaces are adjacent or one area for crew that happen to be there. The rest of the board is going to be divided into space type places. Uh, there's going to be restricted zones, which you must stop in when you fly into them as a spaceship. There's going to be forbidden zones, which are red, which you can't fly into at all. Uh, and then there's going to be some areas that are combined. For example, this location slash restricted zone. So ships will always be in a individual space, while crew will be in, if they're a, in a location, in a blue area. So this crew is typically in both of these spots, or this crew is in all four. Now, each player's board is going to have various different things. So we'll see that we have one player's area over here. This is a full player area. And then we just have some pieces representing yellow over here. A player's board is going to represent everything that they have at the start of the game. So you'll see that our player here has chosen a Kestrel-class ship for their first ship. You get to choose anyone you would like. Uh, and that is represented by this token on top of these little standy bases. And this base here has a little indicator to show that this ship right here matches up with this ship over here, the Griffin. Each ship is going to have its own statistics. So the Griffin has a two attack, a seven hull or defense, a four movement, and a three cargo. And that three cargo is currently holding three crew in that ship. You'll see that it also would cost $5 if we were to buy this ship new. In addition to their ship, each player is going to have a little card here that's going to show all of the resources that they start, as well as have resource trackers and their transit system, as well as an area for commendations, or if you want to consider them in a different way, victory points. On this right here, we have a resource tracking thing. Each one of our resources currently starting at one, politics, tech, personnel, and finance. And that's because we have one of each of these resources over here in our station cargo bay, which is essentially like a bank where every player has a current vault located in the Confed HQ out here. So you can always fly your ship over and pick up resources from your cargo bay. Our cargo bay, aside from having these four resources already on it, has three money that we start the game with. In addition to this, we're going to have the transit system. And this transit system currently has one berth, but as we upgrade it, we can have more berths. This transit system is a way to move resources from one location to another without having to fly between them. So the transit system is always adjacent to everything you control, be it a ship out in space, or a location you're at, or your Confed HQ station cargo bay. Finally, we're going to have a bunch of crew that you can see here that we can earn throughout the game by getting recruits and training them into uh, crew. And we're going to have some shuttles that we can use as little tiny uh, ships that will fly from one location to another. They're very weak and very slow, but they can move and hold uh, influence or control over an area as well as transfer resources from one location to the other. To start the game, each player is going to place their pieces out onto the board. So you're going to draft your ships, choosing which type you would like, uh, and then you're going to place your ships out onto the board. So let's say, for example, Red placed their ship into this sector here, maybe right here, and they're going to place out one of their shuttles adjacent to that ship. For example, maybe they decide to place it right here on this space, which is adjacent orthogonally or diagonally, and they gain control of Wolf Paw 67. Gaining control of this location will give them two, you can see right here, two personnel icons. So they're gonna move up two on their resource track out here. 
Now our other player is restricted in that they can't place in the same sector their ship as the first player, but they can place in any other sector they would like. So maybe for example, they decide to place their ship right out, let's go here, um, or maybe right there. So they're gonna place out right here, and they're going to place a shuttle adjacent. Now placing this shuttle here gives them control of this location right here, giving them one tech one finance and one personnel, which they would mark on their own player sheet accordingly. A player's turn then would start with the red player who has the option of doing various different things. A turn can be represented by this little diagram right here, which is always start of turn and then various different things you can do in the middle of your turn, which will always end with combat and cleanup. During the middle portion of your turn, you can do movement or action in either order. And while you're moving, you can do transfers, and after or before your action, you may do transfers, but you may not do any transfers during your action. So, on your turn, you're either going to move or do an action first, and during any of these phases, except for in the middle of your action, do transfers. So let's say, for example, that our player out here decides to move first on their turn. Perhaps he wants to move because he wants to gain control of areas that he doesn't already have control of. We'll see that we control Wolf Paw 6-7, but we don't control anything else. So maybe he decides to fly up this direction. He's going to fly one, two spaces, and he's going to drop guys off into these areas over here. So maybe he goes one, two, and decides to drop off one of his different crew in each of these different locations. So he's going to send one out into Kai Shen and he's going to send one out into the debris field here, gaining control of both of those areas, adding one personnel and one politics, as well as one technology to his current resource tracker. Now, since we have a movement of four, we can still move two more spaces. So perhaps we'll fly one, two more, and we're going to drop off a guy into this last location right here. We can't actually physically move our ship into it, uh, well, because we're out of move, but we can drop off guys adjacent to where we're already at. So this would get us one more personnel and would add us a finance to our area here. So this completes our move. One thing I want to cover is if we had moved instead adjacent or diagonally twice, one, another diagonal, this would actually cost us one, two, three, four movement, as every even diagonal movement we take, the second, fourth, sixth, etc., costs us one extra point of movement. So this would effectively shorten our movement to three squares instead of four. But since we moved one, two, three, four, we're okay, and we can do this just as we showed. Now, once we've completed our movement, we still have the option of doing transfers, and we still, of course, must take an action. And the actions we can take are represented by this little sheet right here. There are 12 actions we can take that are kind of outlined by this diagram, and then one which is scoring, which is going to be get a, getting a victory point and working towards the end of the game. The bottom level actions here, govern, salvage, enlist, and mine, are all generating tokens to pick up for resources. So for example, if we were to take a govern action, we would generate politics tokens on all of the areas we control that have a politics icon. Right now, just Kai Shen and our vault on the center of the Confed HQ. However, if we were to generate tech, we would have make one out here and one back into our Confed HQ. However, our best resource right now is personnel. Personnel, we currently have a level of five. So we're going to take the action to enlist, which is to generate personnel tokens out on the board. When we do so, we're going to generate one on each icon you see out on the board. So for the ones that we control, that would be two in Wolf Paw. We would generate one out in Zhuan Wu, and we would generate one in Kai Shen, and one out into our own vault. With our action complete, we still have the option of doing transfers or trans transits, whatever you want to look at it as, uh, and we can pick up resources from adjacent to where we're at and move them around. So, since we're adjacent to this resource right here, this personnel, we're going to pick it up and move it onto Griffin. And the same is true of this resource over here, because it's in all of these spaces, we're going to pick that up and move it onto Griffin. If we wanted, we could actually pick one of our crew back up, but we don't need to, so we're going to leave them all there at the moment and keep our last cargo space open. However, you'll see that we have a shuttle over here. We're going to pick up one of these and put it on our shuttle, either representing it by placing it under the shuttle, or we could place it onto one of these little sheets over here. But we have one more that we actually can't pick up with either our ship or our shuttle, and it's just sitting out in space. What we can do with this is throw it onto the transit system, which I mentioned earlier is adjacent to all of our controlled locations, be they ships or outposts containing either our men or shuttles or whatever they might be. So we'll load this onto the transit system. This will allow us next turn to move it directly onto Griffin and take an action to turn those personnel into crew. 
So now we've completed both our movement and our action. We've done all of the transfers we want to do, and we're going to look and see if we've completed any contracts that we have in the game. So each player starts the game with one contract, uh, and there's another public contract available to everyone. These contracts are things you're going to try and complete in order to get reputation. You'll see these little reputation marks along the bottom. Uh, these reputation marks are going to be what you use in order to convert into commendations. Commendations being the victory points you need in order to win the game. So this one says that you need to destroy a rival ship, not a shuttle, in order to gain four credits. Not only will you gain these four credits, but you'd also get the three reputation. Unfortunately, I'm nowhere near the other player, so I didn't complete this. The public contract here says piracy. If you were to deal damage to another player's location or ship, you can steal cargo from them. Unfortunately, again, I'm nowhere near the other player, so I'm not going to be dealing any damage to them, thus completing neither of the contracts. Contracts are not the only way to earn reputation, and we'll discuss that more momentarily. But now that we've looked at that, we're going to do the cleanup phase, check and make sure that we don't have anything more than five cards in our hand. We have no cards, so we're okay. And we'll pass the turn to the other player. Now our other player didn't choose the most optimal starting position, so they're going to start off a little bit slowly. Uh, in addition, their ship doesn't move very quickly, so they're going to move a little bit slower to start the game. Their ship is an Akita Inu ship, and it has a movement of only three, but has a cargo space of four. So they're going to start off, and they're going to start off by dropping off one of their crew in this location over here so as to not have to keep their shuttle there, so they can expand a little bit more quickly. So they're going to drop off a crew in that location, uh, and then they're going to fly away. So they use a transit to drop that off, and then they're going to move one, two, three, and drop off another one of their crew in this location over here. In doing so, they've added a politics, a finance, and a personnel to their own sheet, which they would mark, of course, on their resources to show their resource levels. Once they've done this, they're going to move their shuttle out of the way. So their shuttle is going to start flying off and hopefully try and reach some other areas to colonize and get more resources. However, you'll note that we dropped this crew off so we don't lose control of this location. Now that we've done all of our movement, we're going to go ahead and take our action. And our action is going to be to mine, which will generate finance tokens. So we're going to go ahead and look at where we have finance on the board in areas we control. And one would be generated here one here, and then of course one would be generated on our cargo bay on the Confed HQ directly into our storage area. Now that we've done this, we can actually pick these resources up. So perhaps this player would pick this resource up, being adjacent to it, and place it on their ship. Uh, and they would send this one over to their own transit system to move to their ship for a later point. Since they can't get it directly onto the ship, they could pick it up with their shuttle, but their shuttle's flying off into the middle of nowhere. They want to find a way to get it to their ship, so they're going to use the transit system to get it over there quickly. With that player's turn, moving, transit, and action done, they're going to go ahead and check their card status. Again, they're going to check their own contract, see that they need to actually deal damage to somebody, and heal one of their own in order to get one reputation, so they can't complete this, and they'll pass the turn back to the first player. Now, without going into too many details of moving around the board and dropping guys off, transiting various different you know, tokens or whatever the case may be, I'd like to stop moving guys around the board and just discuss the various actions that can be taken. Movement is relatively straightforward. Moving guys is limited by where your ships are at, what resources they're adjacent to, and how much cargo space they have. Uh, let's take a look at what all the other actions are, the level two and three actions that are possible in politics, technology, personnel, and finance. So, I'd like to start with training, because we've got a lot of personnel on our first player's ship. Training is going to allow you to turn these recruits that you have into actual crew. Now, crew and recruits are both good because they can take damage from uh, damage being done to your ship before the ship has to take damage. So if we get into combat and our ship takes damage, you can kill off these crew, or sorry, these personnel, or you can kill off crew before you actually deal damage to your ship. However, they're also good turning personnel into crew, so you can control locations. So what I would want to do is take the train action on my turn in order to turn recruits into crew. Well, how does this work? Well, first, I'd like to get as many crew, or cr recruits, I should say, in the same location as possible. That's why I threw this personnel token onto the transit system last turn. So as a transfer, I'm going to move it from the transit system onto the Griffin, whose cargo area is now full. If we move him back over, you can see that his cargo area is three and he only has three crew on him currently, or three recruits on him currently. So now we're going to go ahead and we're going to take the action to train moving recruits into crew. 
We're going to look at our current resource level, which is five, and we can see that we can convert five recruits into crew. Now, we must only convert them from the same location, so we can't recruit one here and three over here. We have to do all three recruits to crew on this area if we want to get the maximum efficiency. So we're going to return those three, and we're going to turn them into three crew. Unfortunately, the last two conversions are lost. Similar actions are possible for the other three resource types. So for example, refining would turn metal, the little finance icon here, into money or kilocredits. So if we, our player was to have picked up these tokens and have them on their ship, they could take an action in order to convert these into credits. Credits will be used to be spent for either new ships or parts or various pieces of cargo later in the game. It's always good to have money because having more ships and more stuff will allow you to do more things out on the board. So that's how refining will work. Again, only from one location. So all of the metal you would like to refine must be in one location and you can only refine as high as your resource level. Now for the other two resources, the politics and technology, they work slightly differently. Turning those tokens in will allow you to draw cards and these cards are going to potentially give you the reputation you need in order to get commendations and also will give you benefits throughout the game. So cards can be very powerful. When you turn in those tokens, they look like this, either politics like this one, or technology like this one right here, you're going to be able to draw cards from these piles over here. You'll note that each pile has a discard pile, and the top card of that discard pile is always accessible to be drawn when you turn in those tokens. You again may turn in as many tokens as your resource level from one location and draw that many cards. In doing so, you're going to be drawing cards either from the top of this stack or from the top of the deck until you've drawn as many as you turned in. Now let's take a look at some of these cards. On these cards you can see several things. One, along the edge is the technology level you must have, or in this case the politics level you must have, in order to take that action. The action is going to be called influence, but right now we're just drawing cards. In addition, on the right hand side you're going to see the number of reputation you get for playing this card. And then on the bottom you'll see which phase it can be played in and what it does. So this says that you may remove one to three damage markers from among any of your units. Uh, and if your politics level is five, you may remove three additional damage markers from your units during an influence action. These cards will have different effects. So for example, countermand, which says you may play it after another player plays a card. This is going to allow that card uh, effect to be essentially discarded immediately. So you're going to cancel their card and you have to have a three politics level to do it. So these cards will give you various different effects that you can play during the game. The same is true of the technology cards. You draw them in exactly the same way, except for that you're turning in technology chips instead of the politics chips, but they're going to give you uh, the level required to play them in that tech resource, the number of uh, uh, reputation you will earn and then the effect. So this one says replace one of your crew with two crew uh, and in your reserve or if you have a tech level of three you may do this twice or if you have a tech level of five you may do it three times. Uh, and other cards will have different benefits. For example there are even cards in this deck that will allow you to upgrade your ship. Placing it on your ship and giving it increased hull or speed or sometimes attack or even cargo. The level three actions are going to be using the resources that you got from the conversion. So politics will allow you to play the politics cards. The activate action in tech will allow you to activate or play the technology cards from your hand. Redeploying will allow you to move crew and that seems going to seem a little strange but I'll talk about it in a moment here. And purchasing will of course allow you to buy stuff. So first let's talk about moving crew. If you were to take a redeploy action, and again, any of these actions is always available for choice. The real limitation here is that you must first have the tokens in order to convert them into the goods, either into cards, crew, or money, and then you need these money or cards or crew uh, in order to do these top actions. So you're generally going to kind of take them in this order, but that may change throughout the game. So redeploying is going to let you move crew, and you're going to say, well, wait a minute, I can move crew with my ships. That may be true, but you can also move crew without ships, and that's going to be by taking this action. Dependent on what level of your resource you currently have in personnel, taking this redeploy action will allow you to move these guys without ships. So for example, if I had a five, I could move this guy one, two, three spaces over to here, losing control of this area, but gaining control of this one, if that was important to me for some reason, without using a ship. 
So that would free my ships up to fly into different areas and do different things. So that's how you're going to redeploy and you get as many movement points for as many guys as you want. So I have five movement points to move my guys around as much as I like up to five total spaces. Purchasing is going to allow me to use the money I've accumulated to buy new things, but all of that money must be spent from the same location. A lot of the time this will be Confed HQ, but it could of course be your ship if you've transferred a bunch of money from the HQ out to your ship. The things you can buy are outlined on this sheet as well, so you can buy any cargo token, being any of these, for one credit. You get as many purchases as your current finance level. So right now I would only be able to make two, but if I had more finance, I could buy five different things. The other things I can buy are transit berth. For two credits, I can buy another transit berth, meaning I can move two resources every turn from one location to another, or at least start the movement from one to another location. You can buy or discard one of your contracts. If you really hate this contract because you're trying to avoid conflict, you can pay one money to discard that and draw another one. For every credit you pay, you can repair two damage to a unit or a ship. So you can pay a bunch of credits in order to heal your ships. You may buy new shuttles for two money a piece, a new base ship for five money, and that's any of these available ships. You'll see that we have two more types that we haven't seen. Uh, these are called scarabs right here. You can see they're very, very weak in terms of attack, but they have a lot of defense, decent move, and a pretty good cargo size. Uh, and then we have this gunboat right here, which is called a Clydesdale. And the Clydesdale has the strongest attack and hull, but is pretty slow to move and not real great on cargo. Each of these ships costs $5. You would buy them, place the ship on a new stand, and place it out uh, adjacent to where the money was spent from. So if it was spent from Confed HQ, it would go out here. If it was spent from a ship, you could place it adjacent to your current ships. So that is how you buy new ships. You may also buy the advanced version of ships. The advanced version of a ship costs $8 and comes with slightly better stats and a special ability. This one's saying that the first bombs, so the first four bombs you hold on this ship are going to allow you to take up no space. So it has four free cargo for bombs and other ships will have other abilities. Finally, you can upgrade one of your basic ships to an improved ship by paying the cost difference of three. So that is going to be the purchasing action. Now the other two actions are simply going to allow you to play these cards that you drew earlier. So you're going to play them if they say, for example, uh, on them, influence, you're going to play this by taking that action. Other cards may be played at specific times based on when they tell you on the card when it's played. So after another player plays a card. Playing these cards will give you the benefits printed on the cards, and of course you can play as many cards as you have current level in that type. So two politics cards, two politics level. When I play these cards, I'm going to get the effect, and if the effect is not ongoing, I'm going to place this card underneath my stash, which is underneath the right hand side of my board, and it will give me that amount of reputation. When I accumulate five reputation, there is one final action I can take on my turn if I want to take it instead of any of these actions. That final action is scoring, which will allow me to trade in all of the reputation I have in my stash for one commendation. So that would allow me to get one commendation in the game, and that's going to allow me to be one percentage of the way or whatever percentage of the way towards winning. The number of commendations you need being set at the beginning of the game. So depending on if you want a short, medium, or long game, you can have more commendations to play to. Note that whether you obtain five or more reputation, you're only going to get one commendation when you take this scoring action. So you're only going to get one of these even if you have nine or ten uh, of these reputation earned. However, if you do get to ten reputation earned, at the end of your turn they will automatically clear and give you a commendation, and you won't have to take the action. However, you're essentially paying two, re two commendations worth of reputation for only one commendation. So that's the basic actions available in the game. You're going to try and get to the point where you can play these cards, defend your own ships so that you're not losing resources, uh, and of course complete contracts in order to gain reputation to turn them in for commendations. The one thing we still need to cover is how combat takes place and what the results are of losing combat uh, in terms of losing ships and losing resources. So real quick, we're just going to set up a typical combat scenario uh, and talk about how that works. So without rearranging the board too much, let's just hypothetically say that this player flew his ship all the way out to this sector where the red ship is currently at. And it's now the red player's turn. Uh, the red player has decided that he's going to do whatever he does on his turn, but he's going to stay next to this ship right here in order to try and destroy it. 
So when we look at one of these ships, we can see that that ship has seven hull. Uh, now, this is going to be a, a practice example of combat where this ship and this colony right here, or this, uh, this outpost, are going to attack this ship right here. And the ship is going to attack first. So the Griffin has decided to make a combat at the end of its turn against the, uh, the ship of the yellow player. Now each player is going to roll a die, and each player has an inherent combat value. This ship right here has a combat value of two, uh, and if we look at a... Uh, a Kita Inu ship, it also has a combat value of two, so they're very, very similar in their combat values. Each player is also going to have one of these special dice. These dice have minuses, zeros, and pluses on them, and these pluses, minuses, and zeros are going to modify the combat value of your ship. So let's go ahead and say that the red player rolls this one, they get a minus, and the yellow player rolls this one, they also get a minus. That makes each of their combat values one, and they're each going to do one point of damage to each other. So you would place these cubes out in the appropriate locations, one on this ship, and say that this represents the yellow player ship, one on that player's ship as well. Now, that is the end of that combat. You don't keep fighting until anybody's destroyed, but we've all, both taken one damage towards the seven hull damage we can take. Now, the outpost has the option of attacking here, and the outpost will have one point of strength for each guy that's there, in this case, one, to a maximum of three, because you're only allowed to have three guys at one outpost. So, the outpost could now attack the ship if it wanted to, and it would roll one, so it's got a plus that's going to give it a combat strength of two, and we have our ship with a combat strength of two attacking, which only deals one damage. Since crew have two life, it dealt one damage to that crew, and one damage was done to the ship, now it has two of the seven damage it can take. Because the crew got a plus, he's going to deal a second point of damage above his base, so now that the ship has taken three of the seven damage that it can take, and is nearly halfway to being destroyed. If a ship ever gets destroyed, it's going to lose, one, the ship, two, anything crew or cargo that's on that ship, and it's going to be, if it's the only ship, removed from the table, of course, on uh, that player is without a ship. Now, they will get a free ship, uh, not the next turn, but the turn after that, to place back out on the board and start anew, but of course that's kind of debilitating. So throughout the game you're going to be trying to position yourself to get various locations, collect resources, convert those resources into crew, cards, or money, use those crew cards and money to move about the board and either to collect more resources, to spend them in order to get reputation, uh, or in order to try and destroy, of course, your opponent, uh, and using those in order to try and limit them from getting reputation to turn into commendations. The end point being to get enough commendations to end the game, and the first player to the set amount of commendations in order to end the game will be the winner. Well, there you have it. That is Shadow Star Corsairs for two to four players uh, from Ryan Wolf, and this is a game that's going to be up on Kickstarter if it's not already. Uh, this is a game that has a lot going for it. Of course, uh, the variable player board is going to keep everything fresh, and so that's always nice. Different tiles, different layouts, uh, even different starting positions are going to give you a lot of options as to how this game can play from one time to the next. Uh, the game requires you to do a lot of planning in terms of how to get resources, uh, but not just how to get those those resources, but how to get them to where you need them. Sometimes you'll have them produced out in space at your various locations, your outposts, but you need to get them onto your ship or you need to get them back to uh, your cargo hold at uh, the Confed headquarters in order to spend them efficiently. Use them to get cards, use them to get tech, use them to get money, whatever that case may be. Uh, not only do you have to do that, but you also have to protect your locations. Either have ships on hand nearby to stop your opponents from uh, flying in and blowing up your units or, uh, you know, make sure that you have enough units at that spot that they can fend off an attack. Or, just don't care about it and spread so far and wide that it doesn't matter. Perhaps you don't want to get into conflicts or you want to let other people take over your areas while you continue to expand. So there's all of these different options. You could play aggressively, you could play defensively. You can go for money to buy more ships or you can just try and get your commendations as fast as possible. Uh, all the while, you of course have to be paying attention to what everyone else is doing. Now, there is a couple of uh, extra things I didn't cover in the actual overview. Uh, those are going to be some, uh, one, variant, but two, uh, advanced game aspects that you can play with. Uh, there are some outposts that you can use, which are going to allow you to put your ships on guard or watch, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and this is going to allow you to add damage or prevent more damage when you get into combat. There's also the option of playing with the Confederation ships and some alien ships. Uh, and dependent on how many times you've gone around the table, either the Confederation or the alien 
aliens will get to take a turn, driven by the player that's currently in last place, uh, depending on how you want to determine last place for both the Confederation and the aliens. The Confederation will try and fight off the aliens, while the aliens will be trying to fight anyone they can get next to. So that's an additional thing that's kind of a, a uh, non-player character, but controlled by the player who needs the most help, uh, and is able to try and use that to their own benefit. Uh, so there's a lot of things included here. The cool ships that you can place on those bases in order to customize who controls what ship. Uh, the little minis that you've seen are not actually final, but they have casts for the minis ready. And a lot of things that are going to make this, hopefully, a successful Kickstarter project. So if it sounds good to you, check it out, pledge, maybe even give your support, and hopefully get a new game. Thanks for watching our review today. For more information about board games, as well as the number one board game audio podcast, check out Dicetower.com for reviews, interviews, and more. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. Yeah.